Yeah, we might have that one. There she is. There she is. Okay. Uh, starting our recording, starting our broadcast, um, and I will take a look at our agendas as we go. The front of you, Chair. Okay. Um, welcome to the planning board meeting for February 7th, 2024. I'll begin with the roll call. Uh, Alden Clark. Here. Beth Delisle. Here. Bob Cope. Here. Jamie Pennington. Here. Heather Rogers. Here. Mick Tainter is here. And uh, absent are Charlie Palmasano and associate members Jen Bluestein and Brian Balcom. Uh, are you able to hear me okay through this? Yes. Very well. Yes, yes thanks. Okay, so tonight we have on our agenda one public hearing um, for Four Otis Place, and we have under general business a request for extension. This is just a report from the planning director, approval of minutes, and discussion of various zoning issues. So we will begin with the public hearing. Um, Douglas DeShane, Four Otis Place, a special permit for nonconformities, and a DOD special permit. Andrew, can I, um, Andrew, can I pass, can you pass those? Will do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good evening. Uh, for the record, Douglas DeShane from uh, Finner and Nicholson here representing the Nip Buyers um, with respect to their property at Four Otis Place. Um, I, I do have a PowerPoint up here, but I gave you a copy as well because sometimes it's hard to see the details of the plans, um, you know, from the screen. So I also gave you two um, enlarged plans that I need to point out a very small detail on. So I gave you a blow up so you'd be able to see that. And lastly, I've provided you a copy of the um, the letters of support that we've received from our neighbors. So um, that's the package that you have there. So if I could, I'll. Uh, I'll, I'll follow along the uh, the PowerPoint if we could. So again, uh, Douglas DeShane with Finner and Nicholson here representing uh, Stephen and Sharon Nipmeyer who are here with us this evening. Uh, also with us this evening is Eileen Graff from Graff Architect who did the architectural work on the project. Um, as a quick uh, project summary. Good. Thank you. Sorry, and, and for permission, so you can just say next to for Great, sure. thank you. Um, and then Myers would like to build a, a first floor and second floor addition to their current property uh, and replace some of the windows in the existing structure. Um, as determined by the zoning enforcement officer, the planned renovations would require um, uh, two special permits from the planning board, uh, one for nonconformities, the other because we are in the downtown overlay district. Um, and then as part of that, you know, we needed to go to the historic uh, commission for a um, advisory review. And we have completed that. And I'm sure you know that you've received their uh, recommendations in the package. Next, please. Um, the existing structure is approximately 1,288 square feet in size. It's two story single family home located in the business two zoning district the B2, as well as in the downtown Overlay District. Uh, the existing home and the lot are pre-existing non-conforming uh, in a couple of manners. Uh, the lot is uh, a relatively small at 1,616 feet, square feet, uh, when 10,000 is required in the applicable zone. Uh, the front lot frontage is 42 feet, where 90 feet is required. With respect to the dwelling, the front setback is currently uh, 1.5 feet, uh, where 20 feet is required. The side setbacks, right is at 0.4, and the left is at 9.8, again, where 20 feet is required. Rear setback is at 9.9, .9, and the maximum lot coverage is currently at 46.8%, whereas 40% is allowed in the zone. So we do have pre-existing non-conformities as to the lot, as well as the structure itself. Next, please. Um, the zoning impacts of the proposed use, these proposed uh, additions, are um, that it will change the pre-existing non-conforming setback by two feet, uh, therefore uh, reducing the setback from its current 9.9 .9 to 7.9. Uh, the proposed addition also changes the maximum lot coverage. I'm sorry, obviously it was a typo. 
from the existing 46.8% to the proposed 48.8% that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the proposed addition is actually quite modest in size. It will only provide an additional 161 square feet of living space while increasing, increasing the footprint of the building by less than 33 square feet in total. Um, ironically, because the lot is so small, that a, <clears throat> a small increase in the footprint of only 33 square feet actually bumps our lot coverage uh, by 2.2%. So as you know, it's all a ratio, but uh, this addition is, is quite modest. Next, please. Then. So um, we went to the Historical uh, Commission and provided them a, a presentation. Um, there was some amazing historical information available on this property. Um, and we went through that with the, with the Historic Commission, but in light of the fact that this board is making the decision, I wanted to just give you a quick overview. Um, Otis Place was laid, the road was laid out back in 1880. Um, homes along Otis Place were developed over the next 30 years to fulfill the need for middle-class housing near Newburyport Center Business District. And most of them were inhabited by the clerks and managers of the businesses down in Market Square. Um, in 1884, Harriet J. Schwab purchased a lot of land at the corner of Garden Street, Notice Place, which was at that point, that area was known as Bannister Field. Um, she paid a whopping $950 back in 1884. Um, on that land, she built two houses, including the house at Four Otis, uh, with an architectural style known as vernacular Victorian. However, um, Harriet never lived in the property and uh, she rented them. Uh, and they were later sold in 1893 to the Little family. Uh, in 1909, the Little sold the house at Four Otis to uh, Bessie Moulton. Uh, Bessie was the wife of George Moulton. He was a manager of a boot and shoe store uh, on State Street. So in keeping with the housing for our merchants, uh, uh, the Moultons lived there. Uh, they were actually the first family to ever both own it and live there, uh, which is interesting. In 1919, the Moultons sold the home to uh, uh, Clancy family. Uh, and that family controlled the house uh, for um, uh, till 1964. So they were there the longest of anyone. Uh, but then the house changed hands a number of times until it was purchased by uh, my clients in 2021. So very interesting history. Um, next, please, in. So here's some pictures, uh, just to give you an overview of the home. This is a picture of the front of the house here on the, uh, on the left side, um, as seen from Otis Street. Um, and uh, to the right picture, what you're looking at is, uh, unfortunately, my client's view of the right side of their home. Uh, is the location where the um, uh, Institute for Savings is about to build a, a very large uh, parking garage structure. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is uh, more views to the right side of the home. And as you can see, uh, the forms and foundation for that garage are approximately uh, seven or eight feet off the, off the side of the home. Uh, and then the picture on the right is really just standing on Otis looking to the right of the home. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, these pictures depict the left side of the home. And as you can see um, in that first picture, that is actually the front door to the home. It does not face Otis, but rather it is on the uh, left side of the home. Uh, so you can see a close up there. And then to the right is the picture, you know, standing at the street, looking at the left. Next slide, please. Uh, and that's picture is again looking at the left from the neighbor's driveway so you can see that there are a lot of windows on either ends of the home uh, and then on the right here is uh, um, I apologize but it was the only picture I could get of the rear of the home because with the yard being so short I couldn't get the camera to get a picture so I stuck into the backyard of the neighbor and uh, they were kind enough to let me snap a shot but that's the uh, rear of the home as it exists today uh, I believe there's one more picture. Oh, no, great. So here uh, we can now get to the uh, site plans. And again, this is why I gave you some copies so that you can maybe see better. Uh, but as, as, as you can see, this, this picture uh, depicts the, um, 
the house as it sits on the uh, lot today. Uh, the brown shaded area constitutes the uh, proposed additions. Um, the longer um, vertical uh, uh, brown section with, uh, that shows the addition, that actually sits on top of an, an existing uh, first floor. Whereas the, um, if you look to the left, this the little square that's in brown, that's the proposed one-story addition. So there's two parts to it. Uh, to the left is a one-story addition. You'll be able to see it much better in the elevations. And to the uh, right side is that that longer section actually sits above an existing um, first floor thing. So that's why I said we're we're doing a, a one-story addition and then a addition to a to the, to a existing one story. And then of course you can see the stairs are going off in the back. Um, there's currently a very wide stairway and porch. Uh, we're reducing that to narrow the stairs. Um, next slide please. Okay, so these are our existing and proposed elevations. Um, on the left you can see the front of the home um, and Quite honestly, there is no change or you will not be able to see anything associated with the uh, proposed additions from the front of the home. Um, and then on the uh, left side uh, of the, uh, excuse me, on the right side uh, shows the left side of the home. You can see in the top picture, the existing uh, front door, as I refer to it. Uh, and then uh, you can also see on that picture that the existing um, addition or addition pop out on the on the on the back of the home, and then if you look below, that is the proposed structure. And as you can see, we've added a, an addition uh, with a roof line uh, above that existing structure, and then the part you can see there with the window. And I'm sorry, but I fortunately my my uh, laser pointer uh, is not working. Um, you can see where that new window is to the left of the door. That's the one story addition they're proposing. Everything being proposed is off the back of the home. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, th this plan, uh, and, and now I, can, I need to kind of step away. Um, since we went to the Historic Commission and received their recommendation, uh, my clients and architect uh, thought that it would be a benefit to the project and certainly um, a, a help to the um, to my clients to add a small little uh, roof over that the new back door. Um, so if you um, there's, again, there's nothing you can see on the uh, the front picture existing. Um, and again, to the left, you can see the little roof over the, you know, again, the main entrance. But if you look to the pictures to the right, um, and you look down below at the proposed addition, right there, <laughs> that little roof, uh, and it's what, two feet? Uh, it's only two feet out, so it doesn't constitute block coverage or fire or anything. Um, it's just a small little roof over that rear um, over that rear door. And if you look at the front door, the main door, it, 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 it's the same, it's the same overhang. See, there's that little triangle overhang over the front door. We are just proposing to put one of those over the back door. It will match the architecture of the home and it will provide a little shelter from the rain if you're coming out the back door. So, and if you go to the next plan, um, in fact, why don't we just skip down to the, this, the next one? So, and again, I So this is the upper picture on the left is the existing structure as it is today. Uh, you can see there's some dormers there. There's a, a, a sliding glass door with a wide stairway coming off that back addition. And, uh, and then to the right of that, there's currently nothing there. And if you look below, that is the proposed addition. Uh, we were, are eliminating the the dormers, which the Historic Commission felt were awkward, and many of them felt it was beneficial to remove them. Um, and as you can see, uh, we have the, the second story being added. 
And then over to the right of that picture on the bottom left, you see the, the window, the larger window, that's the little one story addition. And if you look at the new back door and look above it, you can see the little roof that we're now proposing to, to add there, that two, two foot roof to uh, you know, just provide some rain protection. And again, it matches the little protection over the front door support, main entrance, I should say. Um, if we could go to the um, next slide, please. Uh, these are the floor plans. Um, you'll, you'll see that uh, in the middle plan, um, you will see that um, that little infill one story addition we're adding to the back uh, is going to be a small office area. Um, and adjacent to that will be a, um, a half bath. Uh, and then um, if you go over to the next picture, um, which is the second story, you can see that this is, and, and I should, um, you can see that what it allow us to do is to add um, a little more uh, area to the master bedroom and a walk-in closet, which is the, you know, this second story addition that we're adding over what's there today. So the first floor, the one story addition will be a small office and uh, and then the second story will add a little bit of room to the bedroom and uh, a closet. So the, the next picture, the next slide, is actually a rendering of the home. And as you can see um, to the rear, that's our addition. Um, that's, that's the entirety of what it'll look like. Um, quite frankly, this is about the only view that you'll be able to see it. Because if you go to the left side, you know, there's a home and driveways and everything else. And I suppose if you're way down over you might be able to get the angle. But really, and as the Historic Commission determined, that really it's not going to be visible to um, anyone um, other than the, you know, um, if you're in the backyard. And in fact, once the uh, parking garage is placed there, um, there may not even be a view of this at all. Um, in summary, and I appreciate your time in listening to me, um, there's no question that this home qualifies as a historical structure under the zoning ordinance, and that it is historically significant. We, we, we knew that, and the Historic Commission agreed. Um, however, uh, the Nimmeyers truly value their historic home and its significance in the history of Newburyport, and have been outstanding stewards of the home. Uh, they preserved and maintained its historical character and architecture. And in fact, they went about on their own and replaced all of the sidewalks, the driveway, and the rear patio, which was asphalt and, and, and uh, blocks. And they actually uh, redid it uh, by uh, installing historically correct bricks, or, you know, bricks of, uh, emulated the era. So the sidewalks, the driveway, and their patio is now all in keeping with the historic nature. They also uh, reached out to the Historic Preservation Trust uh, when they took control of the home in an effort to document the history of their home and to archive it with the trust and also to uh, qualify to display a historic home plaque uh, on the house. Uh, you know, they, they did that of their own accord. As the first to do so, uh, they hoped that this would encourage more homeowners along Otis Place to embrace their historic nature and, and, and get their their properties uh, registered in this manner. Uh, however, I mean, it was very costly. Uh, they had to pay for both the historic research that was done uh, by the trust as well as the plaque and, and, and whatnot. So it was important to them to understand the history of their home and to, to maintain it. However, in order to make the home just a little more accommodating for living, modern living needs, they are proposing a very modest addition. And, and lastly, if we could go to last sign, as I said originally, the proposed additions are very modest. They're located to the rear of home and will not be readily visible from the street, nor will the addition result in an increase in the height of the structure. The proposed additions, including the materials and architectural style, are in keeping with the materials and architectural style of the existing home, the neighborhood, and the DOD. And this was certified by or agreed to with the, by the Historic Commission. As required under the DOD, the proposed alterations will not disrupt the essential form and integrity of their home 
bar and sec exterior architectural features, nor will it disrupt the lot or its setting within the DOD. The proposed alterations will be compatible with the size, scale, height, color, material, and character of the home, the lot, and within its setting. Just dead on uh, compatible. Um, and lastly, I'd, I'd like to point out that uh, my clients have um, the support of many of their neighbors. And what I gave you a copy of is the uh, Nimar has actually reached out to all of the adjacent neighbors, uh, with the exception of the Institute for Savings. Um, um, <laughs> um, and they provided an overview of the project to all of their neighbors. Um, and uh, with the exception of one neighbor who uh, uh, owns the property, but is a, a landlord, they're not in this area. Um, they did not respond to two requests, but all of the other neighbors did, and they've provided us with either letters or emails uh, expressing their support and appreciation uh, for what the Nipmeyers have done with the home and, you know, in keeping it uh, the way it needs to be. So um, it's a very supportive neighborhood for this project. Uh, it's certainly not going to have adverse impact on anyone, very modest in size, but um, it will allow a little more breathing room for the uh, for my clients. So with that, and again, I will point out that the only thing different in this presentation from what the Historic Commission reviewed is that proposed rear, um, you know, small roof over the rear door. And if you've looked at the Historic Commission's um, recommendations, they point out the fact that everything we're doing is in the back and that it's not going to be seen by anyone. It's, you know, historically correct. It matches. Um, and so I don't think they would have a concern with this, especially where we are emulating the, the cover that's over the, the main entrance today. And it will be in the back. And um, it's really just a very small um, consideration. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And I uh, thank you for your consideration of this uh, of these permits. Thank you. Um, do, do any board members have any questions for the applicant? Just just to confirm, you are replacing uh, several of the windows. Yes, um, the windows, um, the windows that we're replacing were I think were replaced in the seventies or eighties, and they're not uh, they're not in, you know they're not in keeping with anything. The windows that we're going to put in will. Uh, you know, at least have the same design and shape as the uh, what we believe were the original. Mm -hmm. And the, so the, the historic are, commission was in agreement with that. Yes, yeah, and those are the ones in the front that, that you show on the diagram by, that are going two over two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, the, the NIM buyers are, are really, you know, great stewards of this home. They want to bring it back to, you know, its original glory. Hey, any other questions? If not, uh, we can open up to public um, comment for the public hearing. I can't see who's in the room, so I'll leave it up to the planning director. Uh, do we have anybody in the room? Okay. Uh, Chair, nobody in the room, and uh, we have no remote attendees this evening, at least at present. Okay. Uh, we will close the public hearing and open it up for discussion and a, uh, a motion. Um, Andy, one thing I didn't see, uh, I'm not sure whether this, whether this is uh, necessary or not. Often we have, uh, with a special permit, we often have, have conditions of approval. Uh, I see the findings in there, but I didn't see any conditions. Do, do we need those for these two special permits? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I, uh, I guess my recommendation there is just that the board included standard conditions as per usual. Um, I guess the only question would be, are there any special conditions that you would recommend? But I would recommend the, the standard special, uh, the standard conditions we put on our permits. Uh, okay. in special parts. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so any discussion from the board? Uh, and uh, if there is no discussion, I could go straight to a motion. Discussion. I'll make a motion to approve both special permits with the standard conditions. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, because we have members um, 
Well, first of all, is there any discussion on the motion? And hearing none, uh, because we have remote members, we need to do a roll call. So I'll start the roll call on this motion. Um, Alden. Yes. Beth. Yes. Bob. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Heather. Yes. And I vote yes. So we have a unanimous vote in favor of granting those special permits. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your time and consideration. Hope you have a nice time. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the general business. And the first item is the request for extension for 166 to 168 Route 1, uh, the Minko project. Andy? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, a little bit of confusion. Apologies that uh, we actually uh, have this on the agenda, although I think it's actually worthwhile in a way because I get to uh, talk basically about the, the timing of this project. Um, as some of the board members may know, been here longer. We've we've transitioned with some uh, the format of conditions and permits. So there's been an evolution over time. We're dealing with small scale modifications of permits, or even sometimes time frame extensions. Here um, are things that can be done at the staff level. That's something that the board has decided. You know, in some cases, minutia, so to speak, and you know, the board doesn't necessarily need to be bothered with certain things. So there are certain cases where you've uh, put that latitude in the decisions. Um, and obviously there are some situations where things are just sent right back to the board. They're just too, uh, something to the nature, uh, to the that category. Uh, but here it was, it was not picked up immediately. Um, uh, Jennifer, our zoning administrator, and Caitlin, our staff planner, we typically look through our decisions because of course over, over time they're not all the same language and, and, and uh, provisions for that because it's been an evolution. So, uh, it wasn't picked up here that, that, uh, that the time frame extension, the plan board is specifically and explicitly put the decision that the uh, planning board director could, uh, planning director could extend the permit. So um, I guess it's more of a report that I do intend to uh, formalize that um, extension of the permit. Um, I don't have any uh, issue with myself, but obviously it's, it's beneficial here because I get to consult the board and see if we have any questions or concerns. Um, Lou did in his permit, I did talk with him yesterday um, about um, some of the different things, you know, uh, particularly the, uh, this particular project. And he did note that, um, that uh, as noted in the bottom of his letter that they are planning on still proceeding later this year. Um, they just wanna make sure that uh, given that the deadline uh, is approaching the decision that that's extended a little further. So unless board members uh, have reason to sort of revisit the entire permitting process for that project, uh, I think we did end up with a, a reasonably decent, uh, you know, site layout and all the things we worked out there. So uh, my recommendation uh, would be to just uh, grant the uh, extension, but um, I have obviously been talking a little about um, the time frame of the permit and there are um, good things that can come to the city from that housing units uh, renovation and you know uh, revitalization of, a, of an area of the city um, and then other things like subsidized housing inventory uh, qualifications so uh, so I don't know if you have any questions or concerns about it but for me as well it's pretty straightforward yeah no, no issue with the extension at all I'm just curious where they are relative to final drawings and are they finished with contract documents and they're Oh, on the, con the construction, uh, the, we didn't get into that level of detail. I know that they prepared all that and they're basically ready to go, as I understand it, although we didn't talk about the details of their package. As I understand it, that package is ready to go. Um, it, they're really just closing the loop on the, the financing side. Um, and, um, you know, he and I have been talking about the, you know, he feels that um, it's a little bit more difficult these days and we've seen some of that in the pandemic, but he thinks that that's uh, still something they can proceed with. I would note that we also talked about um, in light of the other discussion item we have later on um, the MBTA community uh, story avenue um, stuff which will be discussed next week with the, or uh, two weeks from now again with the uh, city council uh, which you've been invited to i think i sent an email to you about that um he did bring up the issue of the affordable housing percentage which i think i had mentioned to the planning board previously um, and I have been discussing with the mayor and the councilors uh, about uh, this will be a, a highlight, I think, of the policy decision involved because um, the 40 hour district was set up with a 25% requirement. And um, Lou has noted, and it's, it's um, not, not unsurprising, that with the new guidelines from the state under MBTA communities legislation, the, um, the uh, Housing Act that was done a couple of years ago, um, we are actually capped out under that program at 10%. We can only require 10%, and we can. Um, as I describe it, argue with the state, basically come back to the state and make a, a case with a financial analysis why we think it's feasible to go higher than that. Um, but we are not able to go higher than 20% in under that program. So um, part of our exercise, part of our decision making process, we can, you know, uh, modify maps and so forth, but we're gonna have to make some, some policy decisions. Uh, we can, you know, 
satisfy the state here and, and make things contextually appropriate reasonably for a new report, but we have to make some decisions about where we're going to draw the line. And one of those is the affordable housing percentage. And um, he had noted that just the disparity, so to speak, between this project that's been you know approved and has that 25% requirement and now having potential for you know zoning or projects elsewhere um, and possibly under you know similar time frames depending on where things go, um, where um, there's you know a project where there's only 10% required and that's a very big difference I guess for a developer right to carry that. So um, irrespective of the particulars, uh, I'm definitely a, a supporter of affordable housing and think we should try to um, aim as high as we can and and count units on the subsidized housing inventory. Um, but he did he did note that in the context of uh, that that's a little bit difficult to see here. Um, I uh, again, as I've said before, I think one of the strong benefits we've got in the four yard district is that we get twenty five percent of the units that are affordable, not just twenty, not just ten, you know, fifteen or ten. Um, but also, we've actually gotten credit, um, although they're not technically affordable units. We've gotten credit for seventy five percent of those units on the SHI, the subsidized housing inventory, um, which has. Put us in that safe harbor status, and um, in effect, as we go forward, um, you know, March going forward, and you know, with this uh, MBJ uh, legislation and the new zoning we're going to be doing in some areas of the city, if satisfied the state, we will not be able to do that same thing because the uh, the two the two statutes sort of conflict with each other in being able to reach a threshold that it counts under one program or another. So uh, I defer to the chair if he wants to add anything to this. Nope, oh, looks like you committed off the connection. Um, uh, Rick might have lost connection, but um, we'll keep an eye out. But um, just noting the fact that um, he does want to proceed, um, I actually, you know, I did ask that question because I figured that would be the first question people ask will be not so much as a concern about giving, you know, uh, a little bit longer to get going on the project, but more so that, um, you know, if we don't want to see necessarily a long, you know, time before that happens, that he did indicate um, that he wants to proceed later this year. So, and is he asking for a change in the percentage of affordable? Yeah. Um, he it, the, he brought it up as a concern yeah. relative to this project, whereas yeah. the other two projects are basically built out and finished, and you know, right. for the most part, occupied, right? They're basically completed. Um, it wasn't a discussion about one of three Boston Way, uh, but he did bring up the sort of disparity here and a concern about it. And, and we went through the mechanics of the fact that, um, you know, it isn't something where you can simply, you know, make the case under MBTA and to the planning board and the city council here, you know, and those. That um, we should just go back and revisit the permit and maybe lower the threshold that we have comps to the new expectation for developers, right? Um, I have pointed out that you know even if there was a policy level agreement to go back and do that on a project like this, which is something that the board you know we would have to pay on, um, that it isn't just the planning board. I think that you know the, the, just the ordinance itself is actually structured to require that at the outset. It's not a uh, there are uh, waivers that the board can grant under the forty-yard district. It's similar, I think, to what we'd be looking at with Story Avenue area. You have the ability to waive certain standards, um, but that uh, allowance is specifically for things like design standards uh, and and you know, also site plan standards, things like that. Uh, it does not uh, uh, call out specifically the affordable housing percentage in there uh, as being something the board can waive or reduce. So that's a baseline requirement of the ordinance. Um, I say that as a variance, and I'm not sure that the board, you know, absent something from the city council, it seems like it'd be quite a deviation to try to, you know, get that right. So it seems pretty clear to me that not only would the planning board have to revisit something like that, but also the city council. And so um, I, I pointed out the fact that there was some concern about that, that in either case, uh, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about our 40 yard district, we're talking about the story out of area or any combination of how we draw the zone, the zoning lines and the requirements, um, that there'll be discussion about this issue. Um, but I suspect that where we're going to be is that we're not necessarily going to lose ground in the existing 40 yard district. And so um, some might see that as retroactive, you know, to what a project is already been approved and, you know, in concept. So um, putting aside for a moment the state, I uh, reached out to them to have a little bit more detailed discussion about the uh, so called grandfathering of our 40 yard district, um, which is a we're benefited, benefited here by the fact that this district was adopted previously. Um, and then we can essentially grandfather uh, the provisions in our district. However, um, that's according to guidelines from the state. The state could technically modify those guidelines, though I'm not sure they would at this point. They've sort of finalized them, but um, they did make a couple of changes before they issued the final version. So they could modify them further, um, but the way they're written right now, it, it's not 100% clarity as to whether or not they would, um, since we have, we would be modifying them, they could maybe expand the boundaries, um, possibly removing one, uh, Provision that deals with the bedroom uh, side of things, which is something they don't want to see, you know, the housing legislation, the limitations, and that kind of stuff. At any rate, um, 
that we, I, I want to make sure that we're able to maintain that ground essentially with the 25%. Um, it says that we can maintain that even when expanding or modifying in the 40 yard district. Um, but it's not 100% clear whether or not we still need to argue with them through an economic feasibility analysis in order to do that. Um, and so I reached out to have a little bit more detailed discussion. Uh, I see Rick is back with us. Um, sorry, Rick, you missed a little bit of my summary, but I think you probably uh, know most of what I spoke about, uh, which is the affordable housing percentage. Uh, I was just noting um, all that had asked whether or not uh, Mikuchi had asked about uh, making a reduction in, in association with the uh, outstanding or not completed yet project at 166 with one Haley's, Haley's site. Um, and, uh, and I said, you know, we did talk about that. Um, but I also I know the fact that the, it's not just the planning board, the city council will be involved, and we're going to be engaged in that very discussion in the coming months about um, where we draw the line in different areas. And generally speaking, I, I imagine we're going to want to keep you know previously established territory and, and not necessarily change that. So that'll be a discussion, and we can certainly modify or reduce some of the regulations, so to speak. Um, but um, it's a near discussion, and um, and and there might be a, a very big difference between the old state policy and the new one here. It's it's a it's a you know, flipping it a little bit. Good question, Andy. So to recap, is it am I correct in understanding that independent of the MBTA of uh, new the new zoning related to the MBTA and the 40 yard zoning, if he were to downgrade his affordability from 25% to 10%, the pathway for him is not just a modification of his permits, it's new permits. Or a new variance. Uh, he would effectively this uh, aside from anything else we do with MTA communities, right? Going through that program, yeah. the city council would have to go back to uh, amend the ordinance, bring it down to twenty, or allow the planning board to reduce or waive that, which is not currently you know, written in there. Um, and then he would have to come back to the board and modify it. So it's you know, both city council and then planning. It's pretty extreme. Yes, and I think that the the whole you know spectrum of discussion about. Um, and they, I alluded to all of you and what your you know counselors and others about the the whole affordable housing thing. Um, you know, I, I have concerns about the the fact that we don't have the local control anymore to try to you know aim high with that, so to speak. Um, and that you know when we get developers saying we can't make it feasible, I, I think there's a debate about whether or not that's going in the private margin versus being passed on to uh, the other housing units, the market rate units. I agree that happens. Um, but I think as opposed to saying to the developer as well, we can see that you can only do 10%. You, we have to keep in mind that every time we reduce something like that, the expectation that that we're talking about only at best that 10% of the units being affordable. Um, and and that, that's only eight for someone who's making 80% of the area needing income, right? So um, every time we reduce a threshold like that, we can get there in different ways. And I acknowledge that you know, uh, some of these pieces of legislation and the way we do things are not necessarily the best tools. Uh, but working with tools that you have, um, it's disappointing to me that we don't have that control locally, that they've sort of taken that away as part of their uh, uh, guidelines here. My hope is that we can maintain some of that and then we'll have a, a fair discussion about, you know, whether or not we want to go lower. Um, and I, I, I definitely would see uh, other communities aiming at different locations, whether it's staying at 10%, not debating it, uh, doing the fiscal analysis as some we're doing, uh, and we're doing it as well. Um, and maybe they're landing at 15 and they're stopping there, but there's a very big difference. Um, not to, I, I realize there's a small difference between 5% of units, right? And a 100, 100 unit project like the um, Haley's project is about 90, 96 or 98, I think. Um, let's say it's 100 units, you know, 5% or five, five units is not significant overall, you know, just because I mean, it makes a difference, but it's not significant overall. But as a policy, I also have to consider the safe harbor status, and, and that I think that you're talking to the city council, perhaps even more so than the planning board, you might be thinking more about you know design, site like context, you know, permitting, things like that. City council has to think about not just the point, not just the planning board doesn't, but they're gonna have to think about that, that policy level question as well to take a hit on the subsidized housing inventory of seven 75 units coming off. Uh, brings us that much further away from a safe harbor status. So I have to be cognizant that maybe that's something that I think is unfortunate that we don't, that that's something that's also potentially lost there. Um, it's a convoluted set of state statutes. I wouldn't necessarily argue for every provision or structure that's in there on any one of these statutes, you know, um, but um, there's a complicated set of, you know, 40R, 40A, 40B, 40, um, but, um, but in the context here, we're gonna have to make some decisions and that one of them will be do we modify or reduce anything in the existing 40 yards? We try to expand or work out with that. 
state allow us to, to keep some territory? And where do we have something that's only between 10% and 20% decided by the state? You know, and then there. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So with the MBTA communities and their lower affordability threshold, you said that the 40R can be grandfathered. Is that automatic or does the state have to take action to get it? A great question. So the way the guidelines are written, we have to submit formally, you know, our application or proposal, what we want to do. And it definitely is the guy. So the legislature gave a, a pretty broad latitude, I would say. There are some basic provisions called out in this by the state legislature, but the a lot of latitude is then left to the Department of what used to be the Department of Housing and Community Development. And is now um, uh, I have to do this every time uh, named the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Uh, give a lot of latitude to them. It's an unusual situation, I would say, in Massachusetts because we're so home rule based. That, um, but um, but given the housing crisis and the timing, you know, and everything, the economy and everything, uh, that was you know so dinner including this bill, and it basically gave some latitude to the, the state agency to determine what's a reasonable size district, and you know, so I think some things like that. And uh, in essence, and uh, one of them that we're getting down to here is the extent to which um, some of these things can be sort of, you know, um, where you can get credit. Uh, they had guidelines previously that required greater density and they had sort of requirements that reduced that based on some feedback from communities. Um, we, you know, we gave feedback about some things, other communities, a lot of them gave feedback about, well, what if you're at the town line like this, you know, should you be required as a community to do the entire radius within your community when in fact you only have half a radius, you know, that, Anyway, so things like that, they made some modifications, but um, but they have a lot of latitude. So we they it says that they can do so, uh, but we do have to submit and propose that. And that's one of the reasons why, because it doesn't say definitively when you, you know, it says the state, it says the department can approve, um, you know, uh, one that's under a 40 yard that's grandfathered, it can, it can count that area, you know, it's being satisfying. However, there's a presumption there that if there's anything that sort of conflicts that we try to resolve or revise or resolve that. But it does allow us to keep that percentage, provided they're not having an extended argument with us over uh, the economic feasibility. It's not 100% clear uh, the way the guidelines are written, whether or not, um, in order to maintain the 40 yard district, we also have to submit a, uh, a formal analysis that says that's feasible. The way the guidelines are written, I would uh, read them more generously. As, you know, it should be, in my view, read that way, but it should be read, I think, uh, that we can keep the existing territory without doing the feasibility. Things- Fiscal impact or uh, uh, economic feasibility analysis for the existing 40 yard district. For a new district at Story Avenue, totally new district, the way it's written, the guy that's written, that should be something I understand why they want economic feasibility analysis. And I think that's defensible in their regulations to say that that's required. Um, I think the way that the guidelines are written, it should be interpreted, you know, uh, it might be very clearly that they can keep that, we can keep that territory, we should be able to present that to the state, they should be able to accept that. And unless we're talking about expanding the boundaries of the district, um, that we should be able to basically count this entire area of the district here, which is, I think, that one for us, right? And then to focus on, um, I think, uh, Rick had pointed out previously, there are different areas around this, uh, including going up with one and whatnot that we might want to include as part of this. Um, but given that we don't have to have the entire boundaries of the area right next to the train station, that's one of the other provisions in here that we can, we have like seven acres we have to keep over here, but there's 35 acres total at least we have to have somewhere in the city, um, that we have the option to put some of that over at Story Avenue. And I actually think that given that we want to modify that area, maybe, um, you know, if improve it in some ways, this is actually a beneficial thing to kind of do both at the same time. So uh, take some credit for it and, you know, but, the housing percentage, I think, is, is in my view, the biggest policy, um, you know, putting aside the design and land use, so it's the biggest policy level thing, I think, is going on there that, um, you know, it has good and bad. It's going to supposedly, you know, streamline permitting. I don't have any issue with the as of right permitting, as the 40-yard district does, but it has standards for easy, you know, design and construction, uh, and site design. Um, but what I um, do question is just the, the sort of taking away right out of the gates the ability to keep what we've already been doing. Saying, all right, provide the argument that it's not feasible to do anymore, as opposed to saying, you know, status quo, if developers don't like it, there's some provision where they can come back and argue, you know, on their end. It, it, I think that'd be more appropriate thing. So, that was maybe a lot more background, but uh, I plan on speaking, uh, you know, giving a presentation a little more in detail uh, to the city council next. Uh, uh, sorry, on the 20th, um, and uh, that's the next city council planning development committee meeting. Um, so I would invite if you're able to come to that. We'll obviously be having it at each of our, I will defer to Rick, but I think we're going to be at each of our meetings. If not, you know, we've had a special meeting. Right? We're going to be having a lot more discussion about this, but um, in addition to where where you think things should be, um, 
what should not be, where height should be allowed, what parking requirements should be, and design guidelines. Again, I would encourage you to look at the existing courtyard district so we can get your feedback on, on those type of provisions, anything to change, anything you would like to keep or not, where you'd like to see height or not see height, um, you know, things like that uh, going in here. Um, uh, that would be helpful to have your feedback, but I would encourage you to come because having an interim conversation together is sometimes more efficient where we can get feedback to each other, we can learn from each other, um, and, you know, whether councils get more benefit from the, the design background or you know, uh, background that um, that board members have here, that can all help to inform the overall discussion and sort of move it along in one way, shape, or form. But reaching consensus and zoning is, is sometimes difficult, uh, but um, um, so we'll, we'll pick up that discussion. Rick, did you want to... Um, well, uh, just a couple of things. So have we, uh, was this item C on the agenda then? We've moved from A to C? Uh, yeah, apologies. Uh, I, I, so so yeah. I just wanted, I wanted well, to ask. A little bit more context on A, uh, the request for extension, which, uh, and so unless there's any questions about that, um, I don't know if there's, does that make sense that we're real bad item? Okay. Um, and then C, I guess I just sort of rolled in a little bit too much. Um, we probably covered that most of that ground, but um, do you want to do that or do you want to go back to the minutes? The let's just, let's go to back to the minutes and, and maybe we can wrap up C quickly. So um, the item uh, under uh, approval of minutes uh, of the um, January 17th meeting, uh, Beth and I were both absent, so we'll have to abstain. Um, is, could I have a motion and are there any, uh, any changes to the minutes? I'll move to accept the approved the minutes of the uh, January 17th meeting. Second. Okay. Any any discussion or changes or we're ready to move to a vote? No. no. Okay. So I'll call the roll. Alden. Yes. Uh, Beth will abstain. Bob? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Heather? Yes. And I abstain. Okay, minutes are passed. Okay, back into Story Avenue, MBTA, Business Park Housekeeping. Um, hey, Andy, I, I, uh, can you give us an update on, on where we are with consulting? And um, also, I think at one point you had talked about getting together a, uh, a subcommittee um, to look at, or some, some type of uh, ad hoc committee to start looking at this. Can you give us an update on all that? Yeah, well, I defer to you on that piece. I, um, the group, uh, I, I actually had wanted to earlier this week reach out and try to schedule something with the group. So I'll be doing that probably tomorrow. Um, I, yesterday, we had a discussion with the Department of Public Services about where we're pointing on the consulting end for the water uh, sewer build out uh, analysis part of this. Um, we are working with the regional planning agency uh, on a couple of pieces, but um, one in particular is this economic feasibility analysis. Um, uh, we are I'm, uh, finalizing scopes for a couple of contracts for uh, what has to do with the uh, rendering, sort of providing some visuals for this. Uh, the other one is the uh, working out the tax base to the, the uh, tweaks that we're going to be making to the zoning, basically working with the different inputs. So whether it's a markup from, you know, 20 different people, um, you know, a series of, of meetings that we're having and basically modifying that document, keeping it up to date. Um, as we go forward, um, we uh, I'll be coming back to you uh, with some some thoughts I have here about the um, the boundaries of certain height allowances and things like that. Some of what we had in the four yard district where we had you know greater height was allowed near the train station. Um, and I also should note, um, although it's not consultant services working directly for us, um, for more background, I won't go through with you. Um, uh, we happen to be uh, in a working relationship with the Hubbard Kennedy School right now. They have a course they're doing in the spring, and so there's like 40 students or so um, that ended up coming up here last Friday. The mayor and I went in on Wednesday, uh, did a presentation of that, and then on Friday, they came in to do a tour, a walking tour of the story out of the area. Um, we gave them some factual information, and they are um, looking at a couple of different things, we'll see what they produce, but they are looking at possibly giving us uh, some of their own sort of uh, visuals and whatnot. One of the things we talked about was um, trying to prepare sort of a before and after kind of comparison. You know, if we were to take it, this is not our area, of course, but um, Rick, Rick was nice enough to share one of the, the books we have. We collect all these visuals, of course, as I'm sure it's like in the Jamie Hill, we design people, we keep all these, right? Um, but this was the, just a good example of one of the books and just showing. Um, whether it's a hand drawn or I actually, you know, like the idea of having sort of a 3D model could work with, but 
just showing before and after um, how the uh, allowances for height and the mixture of uses and the design guidelines and so forth to create that area. Um, this was done similarly back when the 40, the 40 yard district was done years before, before I got here when it was discussed as Little River Transit Village. Um, and so one of those visuals that they might look at, the other one is the economic feasibility analysis. That's housing you know, requirements and what's feasible for a developer. Um, you know, it's been suggested they follow, you know, the state's, uh, you know, structure for all that stuff, um, so that we kind of see, um, there might be independent results and, and feedback we get from them, we're not going to use any of that, uh, MVPC, obviously we'll be working with them and we're going to see what they're doing with other communities on that same analysis, um, and, um, and they may also do a, um, analysis of some of the fiscal impacts on the community, so thinking about, you know, um, the financial impact of additional growth that might happen, right? New housing units um, and things like that. So uh, a little bit more of an assessment of you know, how many bedrooms might we expect at the end of the day, that kind of thing. So um, school-age children and whatnot. So um, we'll see what they produce. We're not in direct control, obviously, of that scope, so to speak, but we've given some suggestions of what we thought might be useful on our end. And they are interested in doing it. They find it a very interesting project uh, amongst a few others, I guess, they're looking at. Um, they, they seem to have some strong interest in this. Um, so that's kind of a quick synopsis um, of that. There's a couple of different irons in the fire, sort of pulling the information together for different pieces of this, but um, we're going to get it, start getting into the nitty gritty, um, particularly next uh, uh, meeting on the 20th with the council, which hopefully some of you can attend. Um, we're going to start discussing, you know, the pros and cons of different pieces of this. Um, uh, I, I, I've had at least one counselor, you know, express concern about the sort of state mandate piece of this. That's obviously a, um, you know, controversial depending on depending how you look at it. Um, but as, as far as I'm concerned, and unless the state were to change any sort of guidelines, we're obligated to complete something here. So uh, we do have to march forward with something that will comply. Uh, we may not agree with, you know, the, the policy overall and that sort of thing, but um, on, on this or that. But I think um, that this overall process, I think, can be beneficial, particularly for the Story Avenue area, uh, where we've already tried to make a lot of these changes, I think, around the train station with our 40-yard district. I actually see some of the more substantial benefit coming in the Story Avenue area, and whether or not we use all or part of that area, you know, to qualify for MBTA, um, I think we can sort of work it hand in hand as they look at it. Great. Okay. That, you know, that was one question I had is whether we had, we, we were working towards that, uh, including that as part of the MBTA. Story Avenue. The Story Avenue. Yeah, um, it, it, it is a bit iterative because um, a part of the reason I think it's beneficial is we already plan on, I think, you know, I got this, this sort of going along this vision that, you know, the idea is we want to do this, but um, we already want to change the area to allow housing, or, you know, make it more of a mixed use kind of area, walkable, a little bit more of a village node, so to speak, as opposed to just a trip mall anywhere, and it doesn't really represent Newburyport as you come in. Um, so it could be that sort of third node within the city, um, a sort of triangle, these two, about uh, three core areas. And then we have, of course, the National Register Historic District area, which we can direct some new growth and interest in those areas and help put some of the character, which is obviously uh, both a routine issue in the report. So, um, in some of those other areas by sort of alleviating some of those pressures uh, for new housing units and whatnot. But um, I think there's benefit in us, in addition to what Rick had suggested, which is looking, we have other ways to. Again, for lack of a better word, gerrymander into the map to satisfy the state. Um, I use that term mainly because when we have to satisfy the state, we also want to make sure it makes sense in context here. So, well, we might want to run the district up with one, and, and that's good to change things or just take credit for areas that are already developed, for instance. Um, you know, and Rick had pointed that out, I think, uh, a couple of meetings ago in a present the slides he did. Um, we also may want to take credit for what we're doing over at Story Avenue, and that's partly an iterative kind of process. Um, for instance, we could take credit potentially over Story Avenue or take credit, you know, up with one, and maybe the council feels more comfortable with a piece over Story Avenue and feels less comfortable with one piece. We may recommend it with one piece. Well, and it, it's a little bit of an error discussion. Um, some of it won't be, um, a, you know, have a significant bearing on X, Y, or Z. Some of it will. Um, and it's, um, there are, I guess I would say that there's enough parameters going on, so to speak, that we'll have to kind of um, discuss what people are comfortable with, and then we can basically codify that accordingly. And I think it's pretty, in my view, as well as something straightforward about the options we have to get to a result um, that, that satisfies the state and is appropriate for Newbury for it. Um, but we'll have to decide where we want to take credit, essentially, and you know if there's any desire to kind of reduce thresholds down to the 10% or you know, find a battle for 15% or 20% or something like that versus the 25 and the, the 40 yard district. Right. Can I, can I just go back to uh, uh, <laughs> just a little bit of uh, uh, 
base baseline setting because I think I'm more familiar with the MBTA stuff that was originally put out. And but then given given that there was some discussion between the town cities and towns and back to the MBTA and the state where we where you, where you were talking about we only have a half of the radius and, and so forth. Did, what what things did change? Did that uh, change? So the, I, like the numbers, numbers, one thing in the game is we warm iron. Yeah, one thing is they did know how to the town line issue that was yeah. coming up, right? Um, um, there are there are some other adjustments they made. Like one that's notable is um, giving a little bit more flexibility for other areas uh, that are not, you know, direct. Like everything being as concentrated around the train station or right. the per media. percentage that would had to be within the percentage half a mile a radius, yeah. right? Uh, they still want it to be in a logical location. Like they, you know, Story Avenue makes sense with trans with the transit. Essentially, we have a regional bus service that goes through there. The CNJ bus uh, parking lots a little bit, you know. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I debate that right now, right? It's not a functional level of full form right now, but um, that seems like a logical location. They might question, you know, other locations. The 40 hour program looks for that kind of stuff, and I think the MBJ program, right, looks for the same kind of stuff. Um, but they, we first start with the train station. We just happen to be, have been a little bit ahead of the curve by, you know, having this 40 hour district essentially being somewhat in line with what they're looking for here, um, having done it, you know, through a different statutory program previously. Uh, Okay, so I thought the number was like the twelve hundred or so units. Yeah, did so that change because I thought in the email that you sent, I still saw that twelve hundred fifty. Yeah, and, and I apologize. I don't recall if I had the original guidance piece, you know, for that component. But uh, I think that if I'm not mistaken, the number might have stayed around the same. Uh, but twelve. It might, I think it was a slight adjustment, like a very small, like again. Anyway, twelve hundred ninety-two is the current number of units. And if you were to take the entire sort of area that we're getting credit for. Um, and um, that's the number of units they want to see us produce or allow. Essentially, yeah. not necessarily, we don't have to produce them. They say, you know, I don't think you don't have to build any of this, yeah. but we know when we zone something, obviously, we assume people are going to permit. So, um, 1,292 units, there are different overlapping provisions. So, um, you have to satisfy each of the individual provisions, but you can do it in different ways. So, we could have um, the minimum 35 acres, or we could, and, and sort of densely, you know, put all that density in there, or we could have a larger district and spread out the density a little bit. But there's also the floor that they put of 15 units per acre. So um, one of the things that um, that I put in the memo and talk about more is just the 40 yard district is about uh, 40 units per acre as a density. And so um, um, if you look at it sort of a comparison, you know, we could have a smaller district, and then that's part of the policy is how wide of an area do we want to affect, um, you know, versus do we want to have greater density like this? So again, I think we try to get as much mileage as possible out of the 40 yard district. And then work off of that, mainly not so much because we wouldn't want to do similar changes elsewhere, uh, but more because it allows us greater freedom to control what's happening there, whether it's the affordable housing percentage or it's design guidelines or permitting process or whatever. Um, so I don't know if other, feel free to get another question. Just just another another question concerning the Story Avenue area is the is what we're working towards uh, creating a new a new. Uh, ordinance that would cover cover that similar to the smart growth one has all the various conditions and, and so forth in it. That That's why I point to the 40 yard. There are a million different variations of this. Um, Rick, I know I spent years, you know, looking at all kinds of variations of this as I have. Um, there's a million different ways to do it, but in essence, they're looking for a similar structure, which is um, particularly for multifamily. Um, they're looking for as of right, right? We just like mm -hmm. our 40 yard district. That was the that was, that was the same thing the state wanted to streamline there was as of right, you know, housing. But they wanted to uh, understand local context and allow some latitude for design standards to make sure it kind of came out reasonably decent, right? Both the site and the building. Um, we pr we proposed the time design guidelines both for the building and the site. We're looking to maybe update, improve those. Um, I've talked with local streets and we're called local streets group. Um, we would like to think about you know do we expand the bike bicycle parking requirements? You know, do we look for more you know cover for those? We have more EV charging stations that are either ready to go or you know have cars in front of them. Um, there are more, there are more progressive or um, updated design guidelines or things we might want to incorporate in there. So, from the spectrum of all the things that you've seen and all the things that we've seen, um, you know, uh, the only the reason I point to that district is it's a similar structure what they want, and I think it makes sense to kind of model off of something you're all familiar with as a board. You know, you do that changes in continuity um, as a board, you permit it a similar type of way, um, and, and so that makes a lot of sense to use that framework. But I think we have to decide in context where here in the district we allow height and density, just like we did in our 40 yard district. We allow greater density around the train station, um, and then it tapers off outside of that, and then further. So as you get to uh, State Street, because we wanted to recognize the, the residential neighborhood, kind of you know 
downscale a bit. So there are basically three sub areas, if you will, um, in terms of the height allowances, for instance, we're going to want to do a similar kind of discussion for the um, Story Avenue area. Um, and um, we have this question mark about the state land, whether or not that ever gets, you know, comes along. But I think we want to consider a zoning that would make sense of that, should that ever, you know, be mobilized. Uh, and we've loaded that with the state of seven, seeing where you're going to make, you know, see where that goes. Um, they have expressed interest in using um, if something is deemed surplus by the state or partially surplus or could be multiple purposes. Um, the state is asked to, you know, work with us on trying to create housing and using state land. So um, I'm not suggesting we take a ride away the park and ride component. I actually think that's a good thing to have here. Um, but I think it's a question whether or not we can do multiple things, I guess, you know, with that parcel as well. So again, it's we just want to look at that. I think my, my primary focus in the near term is that this something like this would happen. And as we all know, the Kmart site um, is vacant and there's interest in housing there. Um, we happen to have heard from Mingo about a project here. They're also interested in coming forward. So we might actually be coming here see something there, you know, coming forward for these, you know, things uh, based on this discussion, but um, those might be early and then other areas might be, you know, in the future. So. I was, I, the other thing I was curious about this, we've talked about the whole story to have area, the shopping, the big shopping is sort of being over park mm -hmm. as far as there's more parking spaces and stuff, but in given the current zoning, is there really a surplus given the square footage of the commercial uh, zones there are they providing more parking than what's actually required in the current zone? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't actually. Uh, I didn't run an analysis based on that. I don't recall the top of my head where they followed that. Um, but I definitely can see that there's a sea of extra parking that isn't necessarily used, right? Um, and I think the main main thing is irrespective of um, where they are with current parking, I can go back and we can check that. Uh, a lot of this stuff was permitted a long time ago, mm -hmm. um, and it was a carryover of like subdivision things kind of freezing, you know, standards and whatnot. So Anyway, the long story short is I think it matters a little bit less as to whether or not they're in accident than they probably are, um, perhaps, I think here. Um, but, um, but the sum result is it's more about um, do we allow shared parking to reduce our ratios? Um, you know, do we want them to hide the parking behind the building? Do we want to, you know, try to encourage them to put it underground or in a deck, you know, uh, you know hide it somehow? Um, in the case of the Kmart, what we've discussed is that they would try to hide it under the building, essentially. So uh, as much of that parking would be under, almost all of it you know, under the building. Um, but again, that's that part of the discussion, I think, is do we reduce parking and we, do we try to hide it aesthetically? Right, because uh, it just seems with the existing zoning and with the density that you're that we're looking at for the MBTA, that's that would require a fair amount of parking. Well, that, that's true, but I also would argue that there's a fair amount of parking that can be shared. That parking that's not utilized at night right. right there for the shopping can be used for residences, right? So it's um, we can debate when things are happening, but it's a, it's a chicken or egg thing. But if we never change our zoning, we never have shared parking, we're always going to have excessive parking, we're going to create neighborhoods that don't make any sense. Right. That's so that's one of the things we're considering is whether to reduce that ratio of parking. Either ratios or essentially you know, recognition in one way, shape, or form. There's different ways to do it, but recognizing um, the, the shared you know, allowance you know, for parking that you don't necessarily need you know, spaces for every individual who uses if they're operating simultaneously if they aren't, right? And I think that's something that I think would be beneficial here, in addition to getting buildings up against the streets, Dave, putting parking behind, you know, and not having the sea of parking being the main thing that people see. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions about that. Yeah. Defer to you, Rick. No, I'm, I was just asking whether anybody else had any questions. I can't, can't tell from here. I, I wasn't sure. I did put in a note in the email, by the way, in, in case we happen to have enough planning board members showing up at the meeting on the 20th. If we, if we, have, we happen to think we're going to trip the threshold in which, that's the only reason I put that in there was, we happen to think we're going to trip the threshold in which we have a form of the planning board. I want to just add a post saying just to show that, um, you know, we're meeting a lot, but that's a, not my significant concern. It's just a note that um, I don't know whether, you know, how many of you, you know, now maybe thinking about it or will show up. So um, if that's an issue, we can, we can uh, throw something on the calendar. But otherwise, uh, hopefully a few will, will be there. To discuss that. Um, so, what's the, what is the concern with that, as far as the number? Oh, what just that if we have a quorum of the planning board, even though you're not in a regular meeting, yeah. if you're meeting, or you know, I, it would just be better practice to basically post it, even though it might, you know, we never, we didn't ever know definitively. But uh, but if a board is going to show up in a quorum, it's good to post it just so people don't brag about you know that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, not that I necessarily think this is the instance in which someone would complain about that. Um, well, that I necessarily expect all of you to show up for that discussion there, but I'm trying to get you know these simultaneous discussions and feedback. So 
particularly given that the council has to decide on the zoning end, you know, what they feel comfortable with, what they want, and what they don't. Same thing with you, um, what you feel comfortable with, like to change or add, you know, use looking at the four yards as a framework. You know, are there any you know, projects elsewhere? You'd like to see this or that? You wonder if the guideline can be put in there. You've seen a guideline somewhere else. Um, we think we should insert that provision. You know, that's the kind of stuff that we're looking for here. And so we can kind of integrate that in the overall framework. But I think ultimately speaking, the way I view it is we're looking to do a similar thing as the four yard district. Um, here, I'd say there's a lot more commercial um, that, you know, perhaps, you know, I think we want to maintain the overall proportions of maybe. Um, at least, but um, but add the residential and change the landscape to be something that's a little more of a village as opposed to just a residential. Andy, the um, last year um, the council was unable to look at our short-term rental zoning because of the budget. Um, I think one of the things to really impress on them on the twentieth yes. is that they don't have that option this year. They really have to be able to hold public hearings on zoning and get through the zoning by the time that your grant deadline comes around. So that's an important, hey. important thing to let them know early. Yes, thank you. That's a very good point. Um, I, I have been talking with counselors and I, I will uh, be working closely with both the council president and the committee chair, planning and development committee chair, uh, on that very point to try to make sure that that's carried through uh, for a point of continuity. And, you know, you're right that um, the council tends to do in the spring time frame become very consumed with the budget cycle. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to push everything outside, right? Um, there, there is the ability to have a go to meeting. So, um, well, we might see a little bit more of a gap with their attention as they're focused on the budget. Um, I think we try to get as much feedback as we can early uh, and maintain, like Rick said, through that it has to be done uh, because we need to reach a finish line with something we all have consensus over the other day. And um, all those discussions do take time. And um, we just, we, we can prepare something responsive to that, but we have to have that consensus and feedback from counselors. That's one reason why. Um, you know, I'd ask it not to be just the three members of the 11 member city council, the planning development committee, but actually post that as committee as a whole so that all councils can attend. I've asked all councils to attend. I don't know what they all will. Um, but um, in these discussions, we try to get feedback from every councilor, whether or not they're, you know, initially engaged, you know, on their own, we try to reach out, but um, try to get as much feedback as possible so we don't have, you know, last minute concerns that could have been raised, oh, I like this, right? I don't like that, you know. We can't satisfy everybody um, simultaneously, of course, but um, but the earlier we have the feedback, the easier is to, to satisfy folks. And um, we do need to make sure now having a you know a newly relatively newly established council, um, we have to make sure that the new composition of the council fully understands this piece of you know, legislation, what is required here. Um, we know generically, you know, I can say we know what needs to be done, but we have to make the policy choices involved that go along with the map and, and some of the other things like the housing percentage of those. Guidelines and did that, um, but we'll need to be back with councils on that before we can prepare a package that is ready to send to the state and then sponsor it for the city council. Um, we're not going to go with the whole route until we know we have something that's reasonably well, you know, well made. So. Okay, anything else on the uh, this zoning discussion? Uh, no, the only other thing I think maybe uh, more of it just as an overview, Rick, um, and in the context of the rest of you, uh, Rick, if you happen to be, be available, um, I think you're participating in the discussion with the regional planning agency and you can see about our um, scope with them, if I'm not mistaken. If not, I can make sure that uh, Ian can patch you into that. Uh, we have a Zoom, I think, a week or so from now, maybe. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear when this was going to happen. Uh, I think it's the next week or so. I can double check in the count, my calendar. Yeah. But, uh, I think that you're on that uh, Zoom invite for me, and if not, uh, I'll just want to make sure you're added to that at the end. And I, um, okay, I'll, yeah. we can we can double check. Um, but I just wanted to flag that. Um, the other thing was um, the uh, did you want me to speak to the other updates from the planning director? Because there's one there I was going to mention. Um, well, there were, I I had two questions actually. Um, sure. The first one was uh, you. Know, I understand that the. Um, Discussion didn't get very far last night on the global rezoning, and I'm wondering you know, what the updated timeline is and where this is going. Yeah, um, uh, let me know if you want more detail. There's a lot of different pieces to this one too. Actually, a relatively small piece of property, but uh, a lot of different things that have gone into the discussion thus far. So I'm clearly not covering the entire landscape here. Um, so right now, uh, there are a couple of different. There's like a tripartite arrangement basically between the landowner, global. A local development team, uh, which I'll say is Grassi, uh, the, the person who's interested in buying, 
have the purchase and sale agreement. We're not part of that, right? It's a separate agreement. Um, but we have a development agreement with them that kind of set a minimum box around the uh, what can happen to that site. That was basically a minimum standard we went before any of us felt comfortable with talking about, you know, zoning change and uh, which have been brought up to make residential feasible. Um, so without going over all the background that you previously heard from uh, in the hearing back in November, um, the council has to take its action by, um, by um, because of the 90 day requirement under 40A, uh, when the hearing closes, there's 90 days for them to act and all this got carried over from last year. There was a request for us to um, see if we could get from Global a commitment on a deed restriction to, prohibit, uh, to make it clear that there were not gonna be any commercial uses there ever again. Um, only residential, and uh, we were able to secure that and obtain that basically a day or two ago. Uh, but it took a long time to get that resolved. Unfortunately, there were a number of attorneys involved, and even though my view was a relatively simple lack of agreement, it took a long time to get that sorted out. So um, that clock is now tight, as opposed to having more window where we were trying to get wrapped up end of last year or even right after the new year it didn't pan out. So. Um, uh, not through any shortage of effort. So um, so that is now poised to come out of committee from last night's meeting. All three members of the committee voted to recommend the adoption of the as amended version you discussed on November 15th um, of last year. Um, to um, I have worked hard with the council president, the committee chair, and the, um, the clerk's office to try to ensure that the upcoming council packet includes everything that's sort of relevant, uh, you know, so they have that. Um, yeah, and, and I say that mainly because the planning board's report that came out in December of last year um, didn't make it into the council's packet in December, so they didn't technically receive or see that report. Um, and so uh, even though they had, they had gotten it from it, it wasn't received in, in the, the docket. So I want to make sure there's no question they have everything in front of them. Um, there are a bunch of different moving pieces to this, but um, there's a development agreement. There's now an agreement to place the restriction pending the council's adoption of the zoning. The, the restriction gets it put in place, saying no, no, nothing other than a residential in the future, uh, irrespective of whatever zoning laws. Um, and then um, the um, the council has to do two readings. Uh, this is an odd provision in my view in terms of efficiency, but um, our own council regulations require two votes on things, a number of different things, um, um, and that may be beneficial in some ways, but I think it's, it's a lot of ways inefficient. So. Um, they effectively now, because of the crunch timeline, have to, um, um, but we're closed the loop with them, but they will have to vote on two readings, to uh, two readings as we call it, two votes, uh, waive the rules uh, on Monday night and this coming Monday night and do the vote for the zoning in one night rather than doing it in two nights, a first vote and then a second vote they would do on the 26th, I think it is. Um, they'd do it again. Uh, I'm not sure, frankly, that that provision accomplishes a whole lot having seen over the years, just, you know, two meetings of the same subject matter for the most time, same results. Um, but that is something they'd have to do procedurally now to, to serve us all that timeline. But I, in my view, everything is in place at this point. Um, I recognize that there are a few letters who do have some concerns about, you know, what might happen in detail on that site, but we have not really heard anybody who has said that they're uncomfortable with the, um, the overall um, development scheme that's been proposed for the site. So um, the four units, three in the main structure towards the street, intersection and another little sort of accessory structure in the back, kind of carriage house style. Um, no one has really been saying that this is not a, a good plan or the plan they're coupled with. There's been a few details that people want modified, but not something that you would find a typical being addressed before the Board of Appeals, in this case, the permitting board, if we have to you know, debate which board, but in this case, it would be the ZBA based on the scope. So um, in my view, I think we have a fair amount of control over what's going to happen here at this point. I think we have a pretty good arrangement based on the idea of getting rid of the gas station, making it residential, cleaning up the intersection. Um, and I'm not particularly worried myself that we're going to get a bad result there with the local control we have. Um, but there have been some concerns expressed that we haven't maybe gone far enough. To uh, Rick's question, um, I think the I was actually part of what I was going to ask actually on that front was, um, it, it, if you happen to be interested in coming to the council meeting on Monday, um, some arguments were made last night, uh, Council Newton, and there were a few others who chimed in, but there were some arguments made about things like, you know, is this spot zoning? Um, again, that's, I can tell you right now, it is not spot zoning um, to change this corner. The other three corners are the same zoning district. It used to be R3. There's a rationale for doing it, you know, et cetera. So um, dispel the rumor that we sometimes hear people throw out arguments and not really know necessarily the case law of the relevance, you know, behind it. But, um, it's not spot zoning. Um, there is, there was expressed a concern. I think the major reason why there might be some debate uh, on this on Monday night. Um, again, in my view, it makes sense to do the zoning change. Um, there was mainly, um, in my view, some debate amongst councils about the uh, definition change. So the, the change here that's being discussed and necessary for this project included both the map change for the district to R3 
uh, because this district, even though it was originally incorporated in the High Street District, is actually not representative of all of the type of lots that that district was intended to protect. So that was intended to protect the larger estate properties from being subdivided and built out, right, keep the character. These corner lots, and some of them, this is one example, are way undersized. You can't even do a single home in, you know, under the district the way it's set up. So uh, it's not surprising that there are issues trying to get something to happen here. So while we mobilized getting global to do something and make it residential, we also are trying to get something to be feasible there so it can go ahead. And I think we reached that, you know, reasonable good point here. We had somebody propose six units at one point, and, and my response was, don't even come back, because it's not going to happen, you know, it's not going to be an issue. They didn't come back, and we have a project that's four units. It's going to be, I think, reasonably you know, good for the area. Um, I think I would have been until that one, I put the six units in here. And um, so that didn't do anything to come back. But, um, but I think we have a good plan here. Um, um, and I realize that there's still architectural elevations and, and discussions about grading, and, you know, because that might come up very permanently, but all that stuff, just like the planning board, if it's the CPA or the planning board, both boards can review those things and require X, Y, or Z. They can continue the hearing if they're unsatisfied. They can require a peer review. Um, and they're going to have detailed elevations and whatnot. You know, we've, um, you know, recent years, both boards have fully incorporated based on the expectation that there's clear drawings for elevations. Is, is there any controversy over the change in the definition of multifamily? Yes, sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, that uh, mainly the debate about that was the sort of unintended consequences argument, right? That we're we're worried that the change in multifamily definition that allows someone to make two structures as opposed to one, um, even though it's a discretionary federal permit for the multifamily, it's not actually have the right. It's only it's a federal permit. Um, there's concern that it's going to have a widespread effect elsewhere, and so. Without actually sitting down and doing a charade exercise, everybody say, all right, let's look at the R3 district. Let's look at the other districts where this is allowed. Let's look at how much is built out already. And the way that I've tried to respond to that is, um, and, and Rick and Chime, because I know this was a concern he had raised, and, and we had walked through a little bit, was um, where could the, there be unintended consequences? We're not looking at this from the office's perspective, I'll say. We were not looking at the zoning change for this lot in isolation. Um, we saw them say that they thought that it was necessary for this project. That's where the conversation originated here. But Jennifer, our zoning administrator, would tell you she had raised a concern before that um, a couple of years ago, for instance, when the 6C amendment was uh, was made, um, and 6C had previously been used for different scopes of, of housing, but it was reduced now to single and two-family home projects. There's no ability to do two, two different structures on anything larger than that. So the way that I think that I've characterized that and the, the way that I've responded to it to the council last night, for instance, was not to look at it as if you know this is all being done for one property or one developer just because it hasn't been raised by someone here in the concept of a project but rather to think you know as we have looked at it we see that i see the benefits not for a developer here not for a developer at any other given site i actually look at it and i say why would we want to preclude the planning board itself from looking at or being able to entertain a plan that breaks up the massing so if someone's going to put four units why force them to go to either not allow it at all or get a variance to break up the massing rather than just allow the board to decide if they want to allow the break up the massing or not. And a high vote, I mean, it seems like that would be an improvement uh, to, to, to give that option. I mean, there, there are plenty of examples around town of two structures that have been artificially joined because they have to be to meet the the zoning requirement that the, uh, there's one on Lime Street, up the street, with two <laughs> houses, very nice houses. Yes. And they have this funny, odd little connection because they had to. Agreed. And, and it, you know, it, it's to me, this is, this is an improvement to create that option that with the scale of the community and the scale of buildings that we're talking about, uh, to, to give the option for multiple buildings. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a, a yeah. significant improvement. And I don't necessarily I understand care. what it would yeah. be a concern. Yeah, no, and I, again, I, I think it, it could come from a, like a little bit more paranoia sort of about based on a bad experience with this project or that project or, you know, concerns were raised with this decision or that decision. I, again, I, I realize that people have debates about decisions they liked or projects they didn't like, but I think, like, just like you, I look at this as a good thing because it allows us to break the massing, and it's not even allowed as a right. It's a discretionary. You get to decide as a board whether you're comfortable with it. So, um, yes, we're going to talk about as of right housing and things in other areas to set up in the state, but that's a different discussion. And you have control of the site, we want to do that piece, you know, you know that uh, stuff. But that's a you know, four yard district, that's different. This is a discretionary special permit for multifamily, and you get to decide. So, to me, there's 
the upside is you get options, whereas before you're precluded as a board, and never mind the fact that they can't give you something you know, on their end. And so uh, this to me seems like we're at the finish line of something that was, you know, took a couple of years to get to this point. I, I don't, I hope that the, the you know, finer grain details that people are concerned about here don't, you know, sandbag the whole thing here, because while I don't necessarily care about people's individual agreements that they have out there, um, I think we've gotten to a pretty good place here, and it would seem kind of silly to have to reset the clock for everybody to restart the whole process over again. It was um, the odd thing, I think one thing, one odd thing was I suggested last night, uh, two things that came up was, um, Council Z, I think, has suggested that um, we might have an overlay district. And there's a question about, you know, why didn't we consider an overlay district? That might be a better mechanism by which to address this. Um, I think that's a, perhaps an overly complicated way of no one was suggesting a different outcome. So we're basically talking about having, you know, redoing the process, creating an overlay district for one property or two properties, um, and, and then basically getting the same result essentially one way or the other. The other uh, idea that was thrown out in, in concept during that discussion mainly was. Um, Having what is in essence, now, and the part of this was around the context of we have to advertise another hearing. Is it a substantive change enough that the council can just make a tweet now, or do they have to come back to the planning board and do the whole thing over, which affects all the timelines that they agree to? You know, everybody trying to wrap things up. <laughs> so, um, and again, not that we have to be sensitive to all that, but I think it's you know, reasonable at this point where things are. Um, it was suggested, um, uh, and this is something that points out, we might find a little bit confusing if you're trying to deal with the reality is. Um, the idea of having a multifamily definition here, like we were talking about, it would be um, one way as opposed, as you left it here in this, this uh, adjusted version, uh, in the R3 district. Or so for this property and for the other R3 is just around the downtown. One definition that's like we just talked about, but the other definition staying in place for every other area in the city. So we have two, as you look at the multifamily definition, say, can you do two different structures? You allow two different structures possibly in the R3 around the downtown where most of this is already built out and developed with, with too tight anyway to have a second structure. Um, and then not other places, I, I, I don't, I, neither myself as a zoning administrator thought that makes sense, but that was also offered um, as a suggested uh, from public comment, but that was offered as a suggested way to resolve this issue here of unintended consequences. I'm not convinced there's an unintended consequence of the concern here. Preference for bigger, bulkier buildings. Yeah. I, I, I just yeah. don't get it. I, mean, I understand people's underlying concerns. I just don't think that there. I think there's maybe a little bit too much uh, anxiety about something that I think is I, pretty. What, is, what are they concerned? I don't, I don't understand the concern with breaking it up. What is the concern? Um, well, the 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 what I heard from what I heard from Captain Z last night was mainly that um, if you codify something as an allowance, we sometimes hear from applicants or their attorneys that that is. Um, that the council has basically determined that's something they like or they want, and therefore it should be allowed by the board, right? And and the reality is that, first of all, just because the council allows something the ordinance doesn't mean that the board has to allow it if it's a discretionary special permit, right? Just because it, 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 there's a very big difference between um, saying something is as of right and there's no question whatsoever. This is a discretionary permit, you know? <laughs> so irrespective, as long as one of the boards is looking at it, you know, and whether or not you think the planning board should look at it or the DBA or both, um, which it can be, you know, uh, onerous from a permitting perspective and not necessarily uh, efficient. Um, having two people, two boards overlap, um, you know, it, it it's a relatively small scale project, um, and you know, you have that discretion. Um, the there was, I would say, in the background, I think part of it is a little bit of skepticism, sort of debate about, well, would we like the planning board review or do we like the ZBA review? And then there was some debate maybe here um, from some of the partners about whether, whether it might have been better to have the planning board look at it or have the planning board look at it too. Um, I I agree that there's a certain places that the planning board definitely belongs to better sort of permitting entity. I'm just not convinced this is necessarily needs to be one of them because it's still relatively small scale residential, you know, the overall composition. Um, it's not, you know, a dense sort of commercial area and whatnot. So I'm not convinced that it needs to, we need to also toggle in this which board is doing the permitting for it. Um, I, and and what I, the reason I say it is because irrespective of whether it's the ZBA or the planning board, I can't imagine that either one of your boards would approve a project that would bastardize this very visible intersection. So um, in addition to all the controls that are already in place to kind of minimize what could happen here down to this essentially, um, and, and a whole bunch of description about Victorian style and you know, blah, 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 um, you know, limitations um, that have spelled out here, residential, residential only, um, you know, the, um, it's just, it seems like it's being made overly complicated by view. I think at this point, we're at a good point, and I think we should all be able to hopefully see that stuff come to the gap. They should come down this season, and you know, homes starting to be built there. So, so Andy, always. getting back to the question about the timeline, so you, I think I heard you say that the um, city council 
the, the, the current game plan is for the city council to waive the rules and do first and second reading at the same time on Monday night. Is that is that what you said? Uh, well, that is the that is what's going to be brought out of the committee, and they'll have to decide if they want to do so on Monday. It was acknowledged that that was a time constraint that we were bumping up against, and um, and that their own rules essentially were requiring this extra vote that you know might uh, create that conflict. Um, so uh, yes, the typical protocol is the board, you know, the, the council can when it's brought out of committee, and the uh, council president and committee chair, I think, are prepared for the the process. I. Um, we'll be confirming that all councils are aware um, for our discussion that we had last night that um, that it does require um, the waiver of the rules and two votes in one night, essentially counting as two votes in one night, uh, rather than having uh, the site second vote two weeks later just to confirm the things that they already voted um, in order to not have uh, everybody have to restart the process. You would have to have another joint public hearing even for us to get back to the exact same place we're at, never mind anything different, just to get back to the same spot we're in. Everybody involved would have to extend agreements. Uh, presumably, you know, pay more time for this and hang out, but everybody have to extend you know, agreements um, and whatever arrangements they made, uh, and we have to redo the entire hearing process just to get back even just to this. So, and I might just not worried. And so, so, so a, a related question is, um, I, you had mentioned to me, I think that we might not need a meeting on the twenty first. Is is that still the case? Uh, correct. We, uh, with the, as of right now, we don't have any, uh, I can check with that in the morning, but as far as we know right now, there's no reason to be meeting on the 21st. Um, okay. and we had noted that, um, and that was part of the reason why we wanted to make sure we could take up the matter of the, uh, permanent extension for, um, Minko this evening. That was not an issue. So, so I guess here's a, here's a thought and, um, just to throw out there, I wonder whether, um, we could, consider having a instead of instead of meeting on the 21st meet on the 28th have a meeting on the 28th that would be uh, that we would hold for a joint public hearing on this just to get ahead of it in case you know just to be prepared because I know you have a meeting a notice requirement that you probably wouldn't be able to make a notice for a meeting for the 21st but you might be able to make a, a public mm -hmm. hearing on the 28th and I, I wonder if, if that would be something that we could consider uh, moving ahead on and talking to the Planning and Development Committee Chair um, to see whether we could just just to, to move the process forward because there's absolutely no reason, you know, if if the council is unable to get the votes to um, have two readings on Monday night, then we need to have a new public hearing, correct? So so we could the earliest we could do that would be the 28th probably. Yeah, we could mechanically try to arrange for that. I, um, in some ways, I'm hesitant on it because I feel like that might um, potentially sort of run uh, in the opposite direction in terms of the, the potential for things to be wrapped up on, on Monday. Um, first of all, there's sort of a um, assumption here that the, the council is also on board that we need to do another hearing as we're advertising or getting going with something that, that may not, you know, pan out. Uh, probably causing um, some anxiety for the other parties involved. Putting that aside for a second, just the um, if, if we're not sure that the council is there. Um, that may change or have some impact on the Monday's vote, even potentially the thought that there's you know more time to look at this or if it's sort yeah, of okay. going up. I, I'm just sort of wondering whether that would be better. Yeah, I, I, I completely the stat story stuff, and I, I would love to do the same thing for that reason, but I'm hesitant um, as secondary effects might not be beneficial. Yep, okay. All right. I would so pick up a discussion though, with them if you want, but just then, you know, as a discussion, I think it's worthwhile to have a discussion like that anyway. So. Uh, if you want with them, happy to do that with I, I didn't catch what you said the last part of it. I, I, I'm happy to have that discussion with them anyway, just to consider, you know, uh, possible courses of action. I, I just not necessarily sure I would recommend it right now. So. Yeah, I got it. So it would only be it would only give us an extra week, so we could do it. We could schedule it for the first meeting in March if that were the case. Right. Right. Yeah. I, Okay. So I, you know, again, if you're if interested in seeing this happen, you know, feel free to you know reach out to counselors or show up the meeting on Monday and speak if you want. But um, you know, uh, we'll see where the council goes. And, and they, they do. Okay. Um, that was all I had. I think. Yeah, no, thank you. That's it. I, I just wanted to note that if any of you wanted to, you know, get the update on that or speak to that, and then they, like I thought, uh, we talked about the Everyday Community Story Avenue uh, stuff. Um, so. Yep. Okay. So uh, nothing else? Nope. Thank you, Chair. Motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm.
Move to adjourn or second. <laughs> okay, so roll call. Um, Alden. Yes. Beth. Yes. Bob. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Heather. Yes. And I vote yes. So we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Night. I'm so sorry. I I've been